Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. Um, for those who don't know, we're celebrating space this week. So we've got over 30 events, uh, ranging from astronauts to scientists and engineers from private industry and organizations like NASA and the Canadian Space Agency. So we're about halfway through now. It's been an incredible week so far. And I'm excited right now to be joined uh, by Will uh, Pomerantz. So Will um, is the Vice President of Special Projects at Virgin Orbit, the satellite launch company. And prior to that, had a similar position uh, with Virgin Galactic. Outside work, he's the co-founder of the Brooks Owens Fellowship Program, a mentorship and work experience program for women pursuing careers in aerospace. And then even before that, he was uh, with the XPRIZE Foundation, managing a $30 million Google Lunar XPRIZE and a $2 million uh, Northrop uh, Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge. So Will, it's great to have you joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And again, sorry about the time mix up, but I'm glad that we could uh... We could, we could link up eventually. So um, hi, everyone. It's really exciting to, to meet you all. Um, I am here to talk to you a little bit today about how we can get you to space. And for any of you who don't want to fly to space personally, that's OK. I'd love to take the things that you build and the ideas that you have and, and fly those to space as well, because I think that's really, really important. Can everybody see my slides? See, you see, it should see a nice picture of an airplane with a rocket underneath it. Yeah, we've got it. Perfect. OK, so uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of history just to catch you up on what's happened in space, why I think it's awesome, but also why I think it's not quite good enough, and then how um, you and I together are going to help change that in the future. So, so humans have been exploring space actually since like around the time your grandparents were born, probably. You know, the first satellite went to space in the late 1950s. The first human went to space in the early 1960s. And in those 60 years or so that have happened since, um, space has made all of our lives better off. Um, regardless of where you live in the world, regardless of you know what your parents do or what you want to do, what kind of community you come from, you are better off. You're you're healthier. You're you're richer. You have uh, you're you're smarter. You're better connected to your friends than you would have been if space didn't exist. There are a million and one reasons. You could write a whole book on all the reasons why that is true. But just to click through some of them quickly, you know, space is the way that we talk to each other. It's the way that we share pictures of share pictures with each other. It's the way that we get news instantly from across the world. If there's uh, some kind of breaking news story, whether that's a sport event or a political revolution or or whatever else that's happening somewhere halfway across the world, you are hearing about that live because of satellites that that are that are up in space. If you are trying to connect to loved ones, to family members who live far away, you're able to make those connections as easily and inexpensively and frequently as you can because of because of space infrastructure that's up there already. Um, all of us use space essentially every day to, to get around. Um, it is the way that you can go to a, to a strange city and navigate pretty confidently from, from the airport to your hotel or to grandma and grandpa's house or wherever it is that you're trying to go. That's all using satellites. If you've heard of GPS, the S in GPS is stands, stands you know, is used for satellite, it's for a satellite system. Um, it is the way that we manage our resources here on Earth, whether that is farmers figuring out what crops time and how to rotate those to, to keep the soil healthy and keep those vegetables and fruits growing well for us, or whether that is companies looking to mine minerals, or whether that's governments looking to make sure that people are following the rules, they're they're not polluting, they're not cutting down rainforests that they're not allowed to, they're not fishing in areas that are protected for wildlife like some of the great photos that we were seeing in the segment just before this. Uh, having the ability to have an eye in the sky, if you will, that's taking selfies of planet Earth every day helps us figure out how to, uh, where there's new stuff for us to explore and how to better, more efficiently use the, the resources that we have identified in a way that takes care of the people and also the planet. Um, obviously, space is critical to us as we monitor the weather, whether that's just your typical run of the mill, you know, do I need to carry an umbrella with me to, to school today or not? Or it's for extreme weather events like hurricanes. Um, you know, hurricanes uh, don't kill or injure nearly as many people as they used to, even with our climate changing, because now at least we see them coming. And you, you may have uh, experienced this yourselves where you get a you get a storm warning and you know to 
to barricade up the windows or to evacuate or to move things up to the second floor of your house so they don't don't get flooded. And almost all that data that's not coming from airplanes and wind, so wind socks on the ground, even though those are really important, almost all that data is coming to us from satellites in the sky. And it's not just monitoring the day-to-day -day weather, it is monitoring the global climate and it's helping us understand how month to month, year to year, decade to decade, century to century, our climate is changing so that we can really help measure both the inputs and the outputs. So we're, we're measuring the way we humans have an impact on that. And we're measuring just the changes that are happening as a system as a whole, both due to our inputs and due to, due to natural cycles. So we can sort of remove this from the realm of political debate and, and simply just gather so much data that we can act intelligently and, and figure out what makes the most sense so that we can improve development and, and financial stability here on the ground without, uh, without causing major problems for, our, for us in the future. And lastly, uh, or certainly not lastly, but last one I'll show you right now, space is a key way that we keep ourselves safe and secure, not only from nature, but, but also from each other. It's a good way to know, you know if, if the bad guys and girls are doing things they shouldn't be, uh, or if there are a lot of refugees that are fleeing some kind of situation, whether humans caused it or nature caused it. It's a good way to keep track of who is where at what time in a way that allows you know the, the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders or other organizations like that to make sure that the medicines and the food or other needed aid items are, are getting to where they want to go, where they need to go at, at the times that they need to get there. So for all those reasons and, and a million more, space is incredibly important to all of us. But I think it's really important for all of us who are true believers in the power of space, like myself. I, I certainly, I drank the Kool-Aid long, long ago. We, we also have to recognize that space is in many ways really, really limited. There's a lot of things that space doesn't do yet. And there's even more things where space brings great benefits, but they aren't evenly distributed. You know, for the most part, space projects are really, really expensive. And they take a really, really long time to do. And they take a really, really well-educated uh, group of of men and women to, to build. Uh, and so the effect of that is it means that the rich countries tend to get richer and the poor countries tend to get poorer because only some countries or companies or universities or school systems can afford to do these things. And, and others are a little bit left by the wayside. Um, so that ends up exacerbating a problem, amplifying a problem that's known as the digital divide. Um, you know, if, you, uh, if you've grown up here in the United States, chances are you've had access to the internet your entire life, you've been able to go online and watch awesome videos like this. You've been able to interact with teachers of all kinds that are best suited to, to your particular pace of learning and your interests. And there are a lot of people your age around the world who simply have never had that ability, who are just as smart, just as hardworking as you are, just as ambitious about the things that they wanna do in life and, and just haven't haven't quite had the uh, the things that go to you, it, regardless of whether you're living in one of our wealthier communities here in the US or, or not, you, you, you have access to some of this common infrastructure. Uh, that that problem is reflected in the fact that um, very few countries on our planet have the ability to get things to space. So it means we sort of have these uh, we have these checkpoints. We have these these you know these areas where um, there are kind of traffic jams in getting to space. The the traffic jams that happen in the space industry don't happen in space themselves. They happen at the launch pads, and there's only a few launch pads, and those are controlled by only a few people. Um, and that means that not all of us have a chance to, to send our own satellites to space or to send our own astronauts to space. If you look at this map of the world, you'll see a lot of the countries here are not colored in, and there are entire continents that aren't colored in, meaning that they lack their own capability to send things to space, and, and as well as their ability to really uh, uh, take advantage of the resources that already exist in space. Uh, and additionally, space historically has been something almost entirely funded by governments. And while government space programs like NASA do truly amazing things, and I'm so excited you all have already gotten to, to talk to, to astronauts and to, to people from NASA JPL and, and other great things about the fantastic missions that they do, which are really, really wonderful. But it also means that they are subject to the political climate of the time. And whether you care about politics or not, you probably already have gotten a sense that right now politics are a little bit weird. And everybody hates each other and no one seems to get along. And regardless of which side you think is right, if people aren't getting along, that just slows us down a little bit. It makes us a little bit hard to work together on big, ambitious projects. And space projects are about the biggest and most ambitious that they can get. So that's why I think space is awesome, but there's a but there. There's there, there's all these kind of kind of kind of limitations, and, and and really for my company at Virgin Orbit, we are part of a new change in the industry 
that I think is gonna remove those limitations. And first, we're gonna see the benefits that already exist from space extend out to many, many more people and companies and school districts and whatever else. And then once we've kind of broadened the reach of space, then we'll make it deeper by adding in new kinds of capabilities here. Oops, there you go. So, so that, that's really our mission is to, to bust open these barriers that have prevented space, which is cool, but it's prevented it from being even cooler uh, and even more applicable, uh, not just to a few of us, but, but really to all of us. So uh, I'll give you a tiny, tiny bit more history, some technical, some engineering kind of history, because that's really relevant to, to why we think we can finally change the situation after six decades of history. So this is a picture of the first ever thing that human beings built and sent to space. This is a satellite, satellite called Sputnik. Um, the Soviet Union built it and launched it in October of 1957. And I chose this particular photograph of it because there's a person in it. So you can kind of get a sense of the size of Sputnik. Sputnik was a little bit bigger than a beach ball. It was probably about the size of, maybe you've seen like an exercise ball in, a, in the gym at your school or something like that. It, it was about that size. It weighed, you know, about 100 pounds. And think about it. This is a cutting edge computer, a cutting edge piece of electronics in the late 1950s. If you've seen any other pictures of what computers looked like in the 1950s and 60s versus what they look like today, you know that in every other industry, computers got much, 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 much smaller they got much, 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 much faster. They got much, much, much cheaper. And they went from being things that, you know, the army and the, and the, and the US government and, you know, Harvard University and one or two others owned to things where, you know, chances are most of you have your own computer. If you don't have a computer, you've got a phone or a Kindle or an iPad or a Fitbit or something else that is probably a lot more powerful than the most powerful thing in the world was back in the 1950s. So that's every other industry, smaller, faster, cheaper, better, more of them. Space didn't really do that. For weird political reasons, satellites didn't get smaller. They actually got bigger. Uh, they actually got a lot, lot bigger. So they went from the size of a beach ball or, uh, or an exercise ball in the gym to like the size of your school bus. Uh, and don't get me wrong, they got a lot better. Um, so they went from Sputnik, which really its only job was to go to space and say beep, 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 to say, you know, hey, I'm here, I'm in space which was cool in 1957 and less cool in 2017. Uh, and to now, you know, satellites like the ones you're looking at here are the ones that tell us how the universe formed <laughs> and, uh, and help us keep everybody on the planet safe and, and pretty hurricanes and, and all those kinds of things. So the capability has really, really grown, but the price has also gone, grown. Um, satellites today are more expensive to build and more expensive to launch than Sputnik and the other early satellites were. And that's really opposite of the trend of, of, of just about every other part of industry. Finally, in the last five or 10 years, that trend has started to reverse. And it actually started um, with students, not, not too unlike yourselves, maybe a little bit older. Students in, in high school and in university started to realize that you could go down to your local Best Buy or Fry's or Radio Shack or whatever is your local electronics store, and you can buy computers that are faster than anything NASA's ever spent to space, and they cost you, you know, 100 bucks to buy the computer chip. You can buy a camera that goes in your cell phone that is better than most things NASA flew into space until just a few years ago. And that costs you, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. That's a lot of money for a student. That's a lot of money for me. That's not a lot of money for the US government, for NASA, for the Air Force, for other organizations like that. So they said, hey, maybe we can build things that aren't school bus sized. Let's start building things that are maybe washing machine sized or maybe even things that are the size of a can, a can of soda. Uh, and let's start seeing what we can do in, in packages that small. Um, you know, maybe they won't be quite as good as the Hubble Space Telescope or the Curiosity Rover or some of the other real, you know, kind of marquee missions that NASA does. But if you think about it, let's say you took your cell phone, chances are I bet at least some of you have your own smartphone already. If, 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 you, if, you, if you think about your smartphone, you know, that thing does have a camera on board that is better than any camera that NASA flew into space until about 10 years ago. It's got a computer that is faster than anything NASA has ever flown into space, except for the uh, personal luggage that the astronauts bring with them on their way to the International Space Station. It's got some accelerometers in it, so it knows when you move it around, that's how you can do you know, augmented, you can play Pokemon Go or do other, uh, other games like that, how the phone knows when you're, when you're tilting it and moving it around. It's sturdy enough that you've probably dropped it a couple times and it still works. 
it's also sturdy enough that maybe you've left it, um, you know, in your parents' car in the middle of the summer here in, in the southern part of the U.S. or in the middle of the winter in the northern part of the U.S. or Canada, and, and it got really hot or really cold and it didn't break. It still works. So it's a pretty pretty hardy thing. It costs not very much money. Um, if you imagine sending that to space, you could actually do some pretty interesting things with that. Um, so that, that's a trend that happened on the satellite industry side where all of a sudden everybody realized, hey, satellites don't have to be big. They don't have to be expensive. They can actually be small and pretty cheap, which means that just about everyone can build them. And they don't take a decade to build anymore. They take a few weeks or a few months to build. So we can kind of experiment with them and try wild, crazy things that might not work. Because if it didn't work, uh, OK, we only spent three months on it. We learned something in the process. Let's move on to the next one. That's a lot different than if you spent a billion dollars in 10 years trying to put it together. So that's what's happening on the satellite building side. Um, the trick is that the same trend hadn't happened on the, on the satellite launching side, on the rocket side. If you look at the history of rockets from the 1960s until today, they've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they've also gotten better and better, and they've gotten more efficient along the way. Um, but really, the people who build rockets, their mission has always been to go faster and to go further. You know, they've effectively said, well, we've already put people on the surface of the moon. Now let's take people to the surface of Mars. OK, in order to do that, I need an, an even bigger rocket. Or they've said, you know what? We put, a, we put a robot the size of a shoebox on Mars. Now we want to put a robot the size of a shopping cart on Mars. OK, now I want to put a robot the size of an SUV on Mars. OK, again, you need a bigger rocket every step along the way. And bigger rockets are great because they allow us to go to Pluto for the first time or send humans to Mars or whatever it is. But again, bigger rockets are more expensive, just like you can imagine you know, a, a big seven-seater SUV is more expensive than a two-door sedan or a motorcycle. It's the exact same principle applies. And so it was kind of this weird, um, this weird difference where the rockets were getting bigger and heavier and more expensive, and the satellites were getting smaller and cheaper and more affordable. And so uh, our company said, hey, maybe there's something we can do oh, to help out. Here we go, guys. Okay. Oh. Hello? Hey, well, we just had another classroom join. Uh, keep going. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, great. So, so we said, hey, maybe there's a way that we can help out. We can add to what, uh, what all of us as humans collectively are doing. We can kind of contribute to the industry. So we decided to go ahead and build um, a rocket that's pretty small relative to other rockets. And that's about the cheapest thing that, that you, can, you can fly. So that's what my company, Virgin Orbit, is trying to do. And you're seeing here on the screen a picture of what our system looks like. And already, just from this little graphic, you can get a sense that what we do is a little bit different from what everyone else in the world does. You know, if I ask you to close your eyes and picture a rocket launch, I can imagine what's coming to, to, to your, you know, what, what's, what's in your mind right now. You are almost certainly picturing a rocket standing on its tail at a launch pad at Cape Canaveral in Florida that's getting ready to blast off in this you know, column of fire and smoke. Uh, and those things are great, but we do things a little bit differently. Instead of starting with a rocket standing on its tail on the ground, we start with a rocket that's strapped under the wing of an airplane. In our case, we use a 747. And it turns out that starting under the wing of an airplane actually helps you get to space in a couple different ways. The first one is that even flying at an altitude like an airplane flies, so a typical 747 flies uh, you know, if you're if you're flying to go visit family for the winter holidays or whatever else, you're flying at an altitude of about thirty-five thousand feet. That is maybe ten percent of the way to space, so you actually haven't gone that far. But actually, you're already above about ninety percent of Earth's atmosphere, so um, you're sort of swimming through, if you like. You're swimming through less resistance. There's less drag on the vehicle. Um, you don't have to push through that thick part of the atmosphere. You can fly through the thinnest part of the atmosphere, and that allows you to get to space. Uh, a little bit more efficiently with using less fuel, which means spending less money. The other thing is, like I mentioned earlier, in our, in our space industry, there are already traffic jams. And those traffic jams don't really happen in space. They happen at the launch sites. Well, we don't need a launch site. We, we have our own launch site, and it moves wherever in the world we want it to go. So if there's a lot of traffic at Cape Canaveral in Florida, that's fine. We'll launch from California, or Hawaii, or Puerto Rico, or Guam, or Alaska, or wherever else our customer needs us to go. It also turns out that depending on what you're wanting, to, what you want to do in space, um, you want to go to a different type of orbit. So I'll, I'll use the, the classrooms here as an example. If I, if I take maybe two of our classrooms here, and let's say one of you decides that tomorrow you want to start building a satellite that you're going to use to monitor Earth's climate and figure out 
you know, is climate change real and are humans causing it and how big a problem it is. And let's say another one of you wants to build a satellite and you're going to use that satellite to provide internet connections to people who live outside of the US and outside of major major cities, maybe people who are on boats or, or on airplanes, you think that they should be able to, to uh, you know, get online and play Minecraft as well or watch cool videos like this as well. Well, those are two awesome missions. They're also two very different missions and you're gonna wanna do different things in space in order to complete those missions. The classroom that wants to measure, to measure the climate, it's really, really important that your satellite flies over the North Pole and the South Pole very often, because you want to check out how that ozone hole is doing. You want to see if any icebergs are coming off of Antarctica or the Arctic. You want to measure, you know, the temperature of the ocean up in the, uh, up in the in the Arctic seas. Measure, make sure the ocean circulation is going smoothly. So really, you want to be going. If you imagine, uh, so if you sort of hold up your fist and you imagine that's the Earth, you want to be going around that in a vertical circle, where you cross over the you, you cross over your knuckles and you cross over the your your palm. You, you go go over the North Pole and go over the South Pole. Now let's take the other example, the classroom that wants to do internet service. Well, nobody lives at the North Pole and hardly anybody lives at the South Pole. So you don't really wanna spend time going over those because that's kind of wasted time where your satellite isn't doing anything. Almost everyone lives fairly close to the equator. You know, you live at 25 degrees north or 30 degrees north. Nobody really lives too much farther than that. So you don't wanna be going in a vertical circle around, around your fist. You wanna be going in a horizontal circle around your fist, one that goes over, over your wrist and, and maybe the, the front knuckles, the middle knuckles of your finger there, uh, just because that's gonna be more efficient for you. So those two different circles, one horizontal, one vertical, um, you actually wanna launch from very different points on the Earth in order to efficiently get to those two different places. If you're launching from the ground, too bad, you know, you're launching from one spot on the Earth, it doesn't really move, <laughs> it moves with the rest of the Earth, so uh, everybody can kind of take it or leave it. They can fly, fly to those places or not fly to those places, uh, and that's about the only option they have. If you have an airplane, we can fly it up north, we can fly it down south, we can go wherever, wherever we need to go. Um, so, uh, so I showed you a computer graphic, now I'm gonna show you some real pictures. Um, this is our airplane, we bought an old 747, uh, it's, a, it's an airplane that had been used to carry passengers from England to the US just to you go on vacations or go on business trips. Um, it's a great airplane for us because 747s have been flying for a long time. They work really well. Everybody knows how to repair and inspect them. Um, they're really super safe and they're just really, really big planes. You know, this airplane was meant to carry 400 or so people and all their luggage and all that fuel, which means if we pull out all those people, but also all the seats and the kitchens and the bathrooms and the overhead bins and the luggage. Uh, that's just a lot of weight that this airplane can carry, which means we can carry a nice big rocket uh, under the wing. And speaking of rockets, uh, this is a picture of our rocket. So um, this is actually our first rocket, which we just shipped out of our facility last week and uh, headed up to our test site in, 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 uh, in Mojave where we are testing now. And our aim is to be flying to space um, sometime in the early part of next year. So before you finish out this school year, year that you are in right now, um, we should be flying satellites to space. Um, and they are satellites of all different kinds. We're flying satellites for, uh, for NASA. NASA is a customer of ours. We're flying satellites for, um, for other parts of the US government. But actually, mainly what we're doing is we're flying satellites for private companies. And we're flying satellites for students, um, not too dissimilar from yourselves. Um, and that's really, really, really exciting to me because those people are the ones who've never really had a shot before at getting, uh, at getting satellites of their own into space. So maybe before I go to any Q&A that you have, I'll, I'll end with, with that, that kind of message. I think that uh, in many ways, I'm actually super jealous of all of you um, because you are gonna have opportunities that, uh, that I never got myself, which means that really by the time you finish uh, college, uh, and maybe even by the time you finish high school, you might have designed something uh, and flown that thing into space already, which to me sure sounds like a heck of a lot of fun. It's also just a great learning experience. You are gonna become way smarter and way more experienced if you've had the opportunity to do that um, than, I, than, I, than I ever was. And I'm, I'm really excited about seeing what kind of cool and crazy and wild new ideas you have for, uh, for what, you can do with, uh, what you can do with space that's never been done before. So that's my presentation. I'm thrilled to answer any questions that you might have. All right. Well, William, thank you so much for that. That was a great, a great presentation, little history of satellites. And, you know, it really is an incredible time where space seems so far away. But, you know, in the next few decades, so many more people are going to have their, their things they designed up there. So many people are going to get to visit. It really is quite incredible. Agreed. 
All right. Well, uh, we have a few classrooms joining us today. Um, let me pop open uh, my list. So just quickly, we have Mrs. Sharps joining us uh, from Canada. We have Mrs. Dykstra joining us. Uh, she's in Canada as well, grade sixes, just outside of Guelph, Ontario. And then Mrs. Rooney's group are joining us uh, from Simcoe uh, in Canada as well. So they're grade five, six class. So uh, let's see. Let's see if we have uh, a couple questions. Let's go to Mrs. Rooney's class first. Do you guys have a question or two for Will? <laughs> Ooh, lots of questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, at your job, what do you do? Uh, so I've gotten to do a little bit of everything, actually. I helped start up the company, um, which was an awful lot of fun. And now what I do is I make sure that we are uh, hiring the most awesome men and women to come and come and join us and and make the rocket work. Here's a picture of some of the awesome people that I get to work with here, and they really are um, a pretty spectacular group of people. But yeah, over the years I've done everything from help decide you know how big the rocket should be. I talked a lot about how we're we're trying to um, fly small satellites to space. Well, it turns out if I ask each of you what small means, you might give me a different answer. You know, some of you might say the size of an ant, and some of you might say the size of a, of a Coke can, and some of you might say the size of, a, of your car or whatever else. So figuring out which of those was really the right one for us. Um, and then helping and going out and, and finding the people who want to fly on these things and making sure that, they, uh, that their satellites are ready to go, that their satellites kind of fit into our rocket well that we can get them to the part of the space that, that they want to go to. That's largely what, uh, what, I, what I get to work on, which is certainly a heck of a lot of fun. I mean, I work, if you see here, this picture on the screen, that's, that's my office. So I literally work in a rocket factory, which is about the coolest place I could ever imagine working. All right, pretty darn cool. Uh, we're going to swing back, but I want to make sure we, we at least grab a question from each group. So Mr. Sharp, I see your camera's off, but are you guys still there? Mrs. Sharp. All right, well, we'll give them a minute. Maybe they've gone down, but let's go uh, to our group in Guelph. So you guys aren't too far from me. How are you guys doing? Thanks for coming back in. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Hi. All right, big words, Jesse, go for it. Um, how long have you been working on your idea for? Awesome question, thanks for asking. So I've been working on this specific idea for about mm, five and a half or six years. But I've been working on trying to get stuff into space for basically my whole life. So actually, when I went to school, the first thing I studied was science. Um, I specifically studied Mars and the geology of Mars and how things formed, which was a really, really fun job. But I got really frustrated by how infrequent the missions are. Like, I think you guys talked to uh, Bo Back already and some other folks from NASA JPL. You heard about NASA rovers. Those things are cool. But how can we only send one to space every couple of years? Why don't we send like 10 every year? That was kind of my question. So uh, I decided to go back to school to get another degree and to really dedicate my life to, uh, instead of being the one sort of building a specific mission and operating that mission and making that mission the best it could be, um, I decided to dedicate my life to just letting there be more missions so I could get to meet awesome um, uh, uh, folks like you and help you realize whatever your dreams are in space. Great question. Thanks for asking. All right, and you work, um, you know, it's great you do a lot of work as well, um, working with groups like um, getting more women excited and interested uh, into aerospace and such. So it's really great that you, you do that extra, that education, and you give your time as well to really cool projects like that. It's super important to me. It's also a lot of fun. I, you know, I really enjoy getting to, to meet young people because you all have great ideas. You, you have... Um, you come from a different perspective than I do, and, and with that diversity of your backgrounds, um, you'll think of things that I never would have thought of. And to me, that's really, really fun and exciting. So I, I definitely enjoy it a lot. All right, Mrs. Rooney's class, your microphone's back on. So there's just someone making their way from the back of the classroom to the front. I can okay. see them. I'm wondering, um, what what time do you think humans will be able to colonize another planet? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I, I think if we needed to do it, we could do it really quickly. It, it would be very, very hard, but um, 
we have, because of the things that have happened at NASA and the Canadian Space Agency and over in, in Europe, China, Russia, we've already learned an incredible amount about how to send people to safe, space safely, how to, how to keep them there, how, how for them to work there. The trick is that um, it, it will take a little bit of time. You know, if we, if we all got serious about it and we all agreed we wanted to do it and that this was a priority for us, I think we could do it in five, five years, maybe 10 years max. The tough part is just keeping our world focused on one problem for five or 10 years right now it seems really, really hard. Uh, and when well, this is left up to uh, only to governments to fund, you know, governments change every couple of years and, and uh, your MP changes and, and, and your prime minister changes and the new person coming in has new priorities and wants to change things up. And, and, and having those kind of changes every couple of years makes it really hard to accomplish some of these bigger and bolder and more ambitious things. So what I think is happening now is the industry and, and space agencies are getting smarter so that once they decide to go, maybe it takes less time between making that decision and getting there. So you can fit it into you know, the, 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 the term of one prime minister. Um, and also um, we are having other people come in and, and make those decisions in addition to the governments. Now you're starting to have people like, maybe you've heard of Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson. These are people who have made a lot of money on their own, have decided that sending humans to other planets is what they want to spend that money on and they don't need any, uh, you know, any public poll or parliament or anyone else to tell them to go and do it. They're, they're just going and doing it on their own and they will bring sort of that consistency that I think will really, really help. So if, I, if you ask me when it will happen, I'm a little bit pessimistic. I think it probably will take a while, but when could it happen? I'm very optimistic about it. I think it could happen, you know, as soon as five or 10 years from now. All right, great question. Let's jump back one more time to Mrs. Dykstra's class and see if they have another question. What kind of student ideas have you had already? Oh, what kind of student ideas have we had already? Well, we've had we've had lots of them, and uh, and some of them are kind of wild and crazy, and uh, I, I like that. That that's really cool. So one that we already have signed up to launch on our rocket um, was a, a group of students who want to build basically a camera that they want to launch and not put it in or orbit around the Earth. They want to put it in orbit around the Moon, and make it so um, any classroom in the world, whether it's there in Canada or here in the U.S. or wherever else can go online and basically book a time where they can take control of that satellite and they can steer it and they can point it in whatever direction and they can take pictures of whatever feature of the moon they want to take on. So if you have uh, a favorite crater or a valley or a ridge or something like that on the surface of the moon that you think is really cool or maybe it's named after someone who's uh, from your hometown or a hero of yours, I think it'd be really cool for students your age to be online and to be in charge of the satellite you know, for an hour. Or, or, or something like that. And that's now an idea that, uh, that students could pay for. You know, it's, it's not super cheap, but it's, it's within the realm of possible for, uh, for, uh, for a, a university or something like that to, to create and then, and then to put in the hands of, uh, of bright young people like yourself. So that's probably my favorite of the wild days is that I've, uh, I've heard thus far. All right, well, another great question. So what we're gonna do now is we just have to take the broadcast offline, because I do see there's a few people who are watching. So we're going offline because we do have one starting at, uh, with a, a different host at one o'clock. But uh, Will, if you have another minute, maybe we can just do another question or two offline and then we'll let you get back to uh, your day. Sure thing. All right, well, again, uh, Will, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. I think the work private industry is doing, especially Virgin, is so exciting and so important. And uh, I, for one, can't wait to see what happens over the next few years. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, so we're going offline, but uh, Classroom, stick around for another minute.